the suspicion of of strong government. The idea of free of the free individual has had a profound effect on the way Americans view the government. Additionally, there has been a deep suspicion that government is the natural enemy of freedom, even if it is elected by the people. The bigger and stronger the government becomes, the more dangerous many Americans believe it is to their individual freedom. This speech of strong government goes back to the man who led the American Revolution in 1776. This man believed the government of Great Britain wanted to discourage the freedom and economic opportunities of the American colonists by excessive taxes and other measures that ultimately benefited the British aristocracy and the monarchy. Thomas Paine, the famous revolutionary writer, expressed the view of other American revolutionists when he said, Government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil, in its worst state, an intolerable one. It is important to note that all 15 states have state governments, and within the states, there are local governments at the city and or county level, all of which have their own laws, policies, police, and court systems. According to the Constitution, states have all powers to not give to the national or federal government. If there is a conflict between a state law and the national law, the national law prevails. The national law prevails. Intolerable, too difficult, bad, or annoying to accept or deal with. The organization of the American government. The way in which the national government is organized in the United States, Constitution provides an excellent illusion, illustration of the American suspicion of government power. The provision, the provision of the Constitution are more concerned with keeping the government from doing evil than with enabling it to do good. The national government, for example, is divided into three separate branches. This division of governmental power is based on the belief that if any one part of branch of government has all or even most of the power, it will become a threat to the freedom of individual citizens. The legislative or lawmaking branch of the government is called the Congress. Congress has two houses, the Senate with two senators from each state regardless of the size of its population, and the House of Representatives consisting of a total of 435 representatives divided among the 50 states by population. In the House, states with Large populations have more representatives than states with small populations, while in the Senate, each state has equal representations. The President, or Chief Executive, has the Executive Branch, which has the responsibility to carry out the laws, the Supreme Court, and the lower national courts make up the ju- Judicial branch. We have the judicial branch. The judicial branch settles disputes about the exact meaning of the law through court cases. It both interprets the law and determines whether the law is constitutional, that is, whether the law is permitted under the U.S. Constitution. If any one of the three branches starts to abuse its power, the other two may join together to stop it through a system of checks and balances. The Constitution is most careful in balancing the powers of the legislative and uh, executive branches of the government because these two, Congress and the President, are the most powerful of the three branches in almost every important area of governmental activity, such as the power to make laws, to declare war, or to conclude treaties with foreign countries. The Constitution gives each of these two branches 
enough power to prevent the other from acting on its own. Observers from other countries are often confused by the American system. The national government may seem to speak with two conflicting voices, that of the President and that of, that of Congress. For example, a treaty with a foreign government signed by the President dies if the Senate refuses to ratify it. That is, if the Senate Senate if the Senate doesn't vote to accept it, the Senate has certain powers over foreign treaties and with the House military actions. This requires the President to have the active uh, advice and consent of the Senate before taking certain actions on the international front. The Senate also must approve all members of the President's cabinet, such as the Secretary of State and the Secretary of Defense. And because they deliberately use power or authority to of the foreign purpose, a John's uh, meeting for a short time. On the other hand, the President may prevent a bill passed by Congress from becoming law when both houses or Congress have agreed on a piece of legislation or a resolution. It is sent to the President. The President has 10 days to act, not counting Sundays. At that point, there are four possibilities. The President agrees with the bill, signs it, and it becomes law. The President disagrees with the bill, votes it, votes it, it vetoes it. Veto it. Vetoes it and sends it back to the Congress with his or her reasons for confusing, refusing to sign it. If two thirds of both the House and the Senate vote to override the President's veto, the bill becomes law. The President may take no action and after 10 days, no counting done this. The bill becomes law without his signature. If the Congress adjourns before the 10 day period is over and the President has neither signed nor vetoed the bill, it is defeated. This is called the pocket veto. Presidents sometimes do this with bills they do not like but, not, but do not want to go on record as having vetoed. Under the American system of divided governmental power strikes many observers and inefficient, as inefficient and even disorganized. Most Americans still strongly believe in it for two reasons. First, it has been able to meet the challenges of the past. And two, it gives strong protection to individual freedoms. In addition to dividing government powers into three branches, the Constitution includes the Bill of Rights that is designed to protect specific individual rights and the freedoms from government interference. Some of the guarantees in the Bill of Rights concern the freedom of expression. The government may not interfere with an individual's freedom of speech or freedom of religious worship or the right to assemble. To example, the Bill of Rights also guarantees the right of a fair criminal procedure for those accused of breaking laws. These rights are sometimes called due process. They include provisions that someone accused of a crime must be charged with the crime and is 
presumed innocent until proved guilty. This accused has This accused has the right to an attorney and there must be a trial declaring someone guilty before punishment is given. Thus the Bill of Rights is another statement of the American belief in the importance of individual freedom. The election of the President and the Congress. The President and both Houses of Congress have almost complete political independence from each other because they are all chosen in separate elections. For example, the election of the Congress does not determine who will be elected President, and the presidential election does not, does not determine who will be elected to their or either House of Congress. For either horse or Congress. This system is quite different from the way a parliamentary system of government. A parliamentary system of government chooses a prime minister. Another difference is that the another difference is that there are only two important political parties in the United States: the Democrats, who are traditionally liberal or pro progressive, and the Republicans, who are more conservative. In par in parliamentary systems, there may be a number of significant political parties that must agree to form a government. Well, in the United States, this is not the case. The president, the representatives, and the senate, senate, senators are all chosen by the American citizens in elections. Because the elections of the president and the members of the two houses of Congress, or Congress, of Congress are separate from each other, it is quite possible in the American system to have the leader of one political party win the presidency while the other main political party wins a majority of the seats in Congress. Thus, the, the, the Republicans and may control one house while the Democrats may control the other. During the late 1900s, well, most of the presidents were Republicans. The Democrats often controlled one of both or one controls one or both of the Houses of Congress. In 1994, the reverse happened. While Bill Clinton, a Democrat, was president, the Republicans won control of both the House of Representatives and the Senate. Then in the early 2000s, for a time, the Republican Party controlled the presidency at both Houses of Congress. The presidency of Bill Barack Obama, a Democrat, has again seen divided government. Another, after the first two years in both of his terms, the 
the House was controlled by the Republicans and the Senate was controlled by Democrats. In order to understand what is happening in Washington, it is important to know not only the party of the president, but also which parties control the House and the Senate. The Senate, because both the House of Representatives and the the Senate must agree on all legislation before it goes to the president. Legislation may pass the House, but will be blocked, be blocked in the, in the other. Oh, that's why. Furthermore, the party in control of the House or Senate has the potential of changing every two years. Members of the House of Representatives are elected for two-year term, while sen- senators. Uh, serve six year terms. The Senate terms are staggered, arranged so that they are terms of office. Time serving as a senator or representative do not all begin and end at the same time. Stagger. So that only one third of the senators run for elect- re-election each time the House elections are held every two years. Presidential elections are held every four years on the first Tuesday in November. When the Constitution was written, the Founding Fathers had a disagreement about how the President should be elected. Some did not want the members of Congress to choose the President, and others were afraid to leave their choice entirely to the voters. The, the result was a compromise. The Electoral College, the Electoral College a system for indirectly Electing the president, the, the system president, the system presides today. In presidential elections, people are actually voting for representatives called electors, and it is these electors who officially choose the president. While with the electoral colleague system, the winner of the plurality, the highest number of each state's population votes gets all of the state's electoral votes, in most cases. There are several exceptions. The number of each plurality, the number of votes received by the winning person in an election where there are three or more people trying to be elected. There are several. There are several exceptions. Uh, though the number of electors votes varies according to each state's population, it is still possible for a person to be elected president without getting the highest number of the population, popular or individual votes. Although Americans were aware of the electoral colleague sister. The average voter did not give it much thought. Until the election of 2000. There had been only three previous instances of president ever losing the popular vote but winning the electoral vote. But it seems a remote possibility. The last time it had happened was in 1888, when Benjamin Harrison won the presidency. Even though Grover Cleveland had the majority of population votes, and other and all through the 1900s, the presidents who were elected had won at least a pub plurality, the highest number of popular votes. In addition to winning the electoral votes. However, in the election of 2000, all George the Democrats candidates won more popular votes than George Bush, 
Republican candidate, but Bush won the most electoral votes and became president. In the 2004 election between George Bush and John Kerry, the electoral colleague was not an issue. Because Bush won both the popular vote and the electoral vote. The result of the election of 200 sent shock waves through the American public system. One reason was that the vote was incredibly close. And several states had to count their votes to a, a, a second time. The state with the most controversial results was Florida, where the governor of the state was Jeb Bush. George. Bush brother Bush brother Arnold Cole had won the popular vote nationwide. Whoever won the 25 Florida electoral votes would win the election. The recount of the votes in Florida showed Bush winning by fewer than 1,000 votes out of almost 6 million votes cast. After a series of legal challenges, the U.S. Supreme Court decided about a month later the election that the Florida State Legislature had, after the, uh, had the right to stop recounting the ballots and uh, certify the electoral votes. The Supreme Court ruled that a state had the, has the ultimate right to determine how its electors are chosen. The idea of the free individual. In the late 1700s, most Americans expected the new nation, national government created by the Constitution to leave them alone to pursue their individual growth. They believed the central purpose of government was to create the conditions most favorable to the development of the free individual. Before the Civil War, of the 1860s, the American idea of this free individual was the frontier settler and the small farmer. President Thomas Jefferson expressed this idea when he said, "Those who labor in the early are the chosen people of God." If ever he had the chosen people, Jefferson glorified the farmers for being free individuals who relied on no one but themselves for their by themselves for their daily needs. Being, de being dependent on none but themselves, farmers, he believed, were the most hardest of citizens. Throughout, throughout his life, Jefferson favored a small, weak form of government, which he believed would encourage the development of a nation of free, self-reliant farmers and citizens. From the end of the Civil War until the Great Depression of the 1930s, the successful business person replaced the farmer and the frontier settlers as the ideal expression of the free individual. The prevailing view of Americans was that government should not interfere in business. If it were to do so, it would threaten the development of free individuals whose competitive spirit, self-reliance, and hard work were developing the United States into a land of greater and greater material prosperity. Government, therefore, remained small and inactive in relation to the great size of the nation and the and the amount of power held by business corporations. 
some government regulations were in place during this period, but this had only a small impact on business practices. From the 1870s until the 1930s, business organizations had ideas dominated American government and politics. During much of this time, the Republican Party was in power and it strongly supported these policies. The development of big government. Traditionally, Republicans have favored letting businesses compete with little or no government regulations, such as the free and prime system regulate itself in the marketplace. On the other hand, Democrats have traditionally favored using government to regulate businesses. protect consumers and workers and also to solve social problems. Not su surprisingly, it was the Democratic president who presided over the operation of big government. The Great Depression of the 1930s greatly weakened the British president's position as the American idea of the free individual, and uh, big business lost respect. The Depression also created the need for emergency government action to help the needy on a scale never before seen in the United States in peacetime. As a result, the idea of the government that government should be small and the initiative was largely abandoned. Moreover, the idea of the free individual underwent some very important changes. The widespread unemployment and other economic hardships of the Depression gave rise to the new assumption that it, individuals could not be expected to rely solely on themselves in providing for their economic security. This new assumption, in turn, led to a large and active role for the gov national government in helping individuals meet their daily needs. The Democratic Party, led by President Franklin Roosevelt, brought about a number of changes in the 1930s. Roosevelt, which he referred to as the New Deal for Americans. Even with the return of prosperity, after the Depression and the World War II, the growth of government's role is the growth of government's role in helping to provide economic security for individuals did not end. It continued in the prosperous post-war years, and it was greatly expanded during the presidency of another Democrat, Lyndon Johnson, in the 1960s. This first New Deal grew into what some saw as a permanent welfare state that provided payments for retired persons. Government checks for the employed, unemployed, support for family with dependent children, and no father to provide income. health care for the poor and the elderly, and other government benefits. Johnson called the new welfare program the Gateway Society, a controversy over entitlement. The government of big government and the establishment of government social programs is not without controversy. On the other hand, on one hand, some Americans feel that economic security provided by the government will weaken self reliance, an idea that is closely associated with in the minds of Americans with individual freedom. At worst, it represents a danger to individual freedom by making an increasing number of Americans dependent on the government instead of on themselves. In this way, a strong tradition of, traditions of individualism and self-reliance have made Americans less 
accepting of social programs than the citizens of other democracies such as those in Western Europe. Which have more intensive, extensive social programs than those of the United States. A peer research study reveals the contrast between European and the American attitudes. Americans' opinion continues to differ considerably from those of Western Europeans when it comes to view, views of individualism and the role of the state. Nearly 6 in 10 Americans believe it is more important for everyone to be free to pursue their life skills without interference from the state. Well, just 64 say it is more important to for the state to play an active role in the society so as to guarantee that nobody is in need. Americans generally are not in favor of European style socialism that guarantees benefits of for, for all who are needed. Indeed, some consider socialism a, socialism a potentially dangerous for an economic system. Some conservatives have accused President Obama of being a socialist for some of his literal stands. On the other hand, most Americans believe that their national government should provide some kind of safety net to take care of people in certain circumstances such as temporary loss of employment, damages for a natural disaster such as a hurricane, and of course retirement. It is interesting that the term of those, the term of these benefits have changed. We used to make a di distinction between welfare benefits and entitlement. Programs such as unemployment benefits, food stamps, and medical, medicaid, healthcare for the poor, were known as welfare, social security, and the medicare, healthcare for the retired, were seen as entitlements because working Americans and their employees, employers pay into the systems. Therefore, when workers retire, they consider that they have paid for these benefits and that they are entitled to them. Now, the term welfare is almost never used, and all these government benefits are referred to as entitlement. Well, most Americans would believe that the national government should, or should provide them with some support if they should need it. They may disagree about how much support and for how long. Democrats generally favor more general, general support from the government than Republicans. Republicans believe in a small, smaller role for the government and a greater emphasis on individual representative responsibility during the 2012 election. Republican President candidate Mitt Romney was overheard that saying 47% of Americans were divided or are saw themselves as victims who could not take care of themselves. There are 47 percent of the people who will vote for the president no matter what, who are dependent upon government.
who believe that they are victims. They are people who pay in no, no income tax. And so my job is not to worry about those people. I will never convince that them that they should take personal responsibility and uh, care for them their lives. In fact, how, about half of all Americans households have someone who receives some aid from the federal government. However, this number includes people who are retired and are receiving social security and Medicare benefits. Now about 14% of the population plus another 2% who are receiving under social security benefits. Most Americans believe that they are in t earned, they have earned the right to having social security and Medicare when they retire. But the problem is that these benefits now take about one third of the federal budget. As the population ages, there are fewer younger workers and their employers paying social security taxes into the system, and more retired workers taking money out. Americans are living longer in retirement, and their medical expenses are rising because older Americans are more likely than young people to vote. Politicians, politicians pay particular attention to their needs. They want to want the older Americans' votes. However, what has budget deficits? Deficit. The difference between the amount of money that a government spends and the amount that it takes in from taxes and other activities. Well, the reality is that some adjustments to all entitlements are likely to be needed, including Social Security and Medicare. The role of the role of special interest groups. Over time, practically all social and economic classes of Americans have seen the need to take care of or to protect themselves from the actions of government, especially in the, the national government. To accomplish this, Americans with similar interests have from the special interest groups to more effectively influence the actions of the government. The special interest groups are often called lobbying groups or pressure groups. Lobbying, trying to influence the government or someone with political power so that they make laws favorable to you. Although lobbying groups have existed throughout the nation's history, they have grown significantly in both numbers and power since the late 1800s. The National Rifle Association, mentioned in Chapter 4, is an example of a powerful and effective lobby. Its, members are, its members are mostly people who own guns for hunting, target practice, and personal protection, the, the NRA, however, receives a good deal of money from business corporations that manufacture guns. Because of the attitudes and the interests of its members, the NRA strongly opposes all, almost all government restrictions on the sale of all handguns, rifles, shotguns, and even semi-automatic and assault, assault weapons. Even though most of the general public favors some favors some gun control measures, the NRA has always been able to block the passage of most gun control legislation. See power on page 147. 